Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Five Drinks for Midnight, Quarantine Ooh. Edition. Today we're talking to New York Times cocktail and spirits enthusiast writer Robert Simonson. But if you don't read the New York Times, that's okay, because he wrote this book, this book, this book, and this book. But before we do, like and subscribe. It can really help us out. Thanks! Drinks or midnight, five drinks, five questions, midnight, whatever comes first. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm happy to be here. Uh, we're actually filming this the day after election day, so um, I'm happy to be drinking. <laughs> I think everybody is right now, so. Uh, That's right. Uh, what, what's our first drink? Our first drink is uh, simple. Since we're doing five drinks in a short period of time, I thought I would start out light. So it's just a simple uh, whiskey highball. Excellent. Uh, since my wife and I have been quarantining this year, you know, uh, everyone's doing a little more drinking at home and everyone's keeping it pretty simple and nothing's more simple than a whiskey highball. Um, I usually try to do it with uh, Japanese whiskey. They, they, they make kind of a religion out of the highball they do. In, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, but I have drunk all the Japanese whiskey during, uh, the, during uh, the pandemic. So um, I made it... Uh, most, most any whiskey can, whatever whiskey you like will go in a whiskey highball. So I'm doing some uh, Kilbegin single pot still Irish whiskey. Okay, it's good, nice. It's good single pot. And, um, and just, you know, some seltzer water. Cheers. Right. Cheers. <laughs> lovely. Uh, Kilbegin is amazing. That's a yeah. lovely, no, lovely good brand. Stuff. All right. So question one. Yeah. Uh, how does a guy that went from writing about theater end up being a James Beard nominated cocktail author? Ah, yes. Um, yes, it's, I've always been a journalist, I've always been a writer, but I did change direction, uh, did a 180 halfway through my career. I wrote about theater for 15 to 20 years, and the simple truth is I just got burned out. I just um, didn't want to write about theater anymore. I, you know, I just got tired of writing about the same subject over and over again. And theater is a very small world. Um, and so you just meet the same people over and over again and interview the same people. So right around, I don't know, when I was turning 40, I just started looking around and thinking, um, maybe it's time to change my beat. What else am I interested in? And I was very interested in theater. I, I love theater. Um, I was always interested in wine and I always wanted to know more about wine. Uh, so I took some wine classes, um, some rather extensive ones, you know, for a year or two, and I educated myself to the point where I felt I could write knowledgeably about wine. And I started writing about wine for a newspaper called the New York Sun, which doesn't exist anymore, but existed for about five years in, uh, in the aughts. And then I was invited by accident to Tales of the Cocktail, which is a cocktail convention held every July in New Orleans. And I said yes, because I'd never been to New Orleans. Quite frankly, my main reason for going was to see New Orleans. I didn't really care about the convention at all. But once I got there, I realized there was this whole world out there of cocktail enthusiasts and cocktail bartenders, and they were very serious about it, very passionate about it. And what's more, um, they, were a, they were a fun group. They were fun people to hang around, which was different from the wine people. The wine people weren't that much fun to hang around. They were a bit stuffy and a bit pretentious. And so I thought, well, let's let's write about these people instead, these cocktail people. They, they, that seems like much better copy. And also the cocktail revival, this was 2006, the cocktail revival was just starting and nobody was really writing about it yet. And so there was uh, an opportunity to get in on the ground level on something and become a quote unquote cocktail writer, which was not a title that existed back then, but now it does exist. Yeah. So there's that, that's how it happened. 
excellent. I mean, I think that's an amazing story. And that's also extremely dangerous to go to New Orleans for the very first time during Tales. I, I, I mean, that that is... And in July, when yeah. it was like frighteningly hot. <laughs> um, so I, I learned very quickly that you move slow in that city if you want to survive. Yeah, that, that I, I, yeah, the, the tale, like they, New Orleans is known for their, their drinking uh, culture and like they, the bar, the bar's open at 6 a.m. and you're, you, you got yeah. people like- Oh, and like, you can yeah, take yeah. your drinks on the street. Yeah. Which is shocking to me. They, and a drive through I mean, we're both from yeah. Wisconsin and our drinking laws are pretty lax and they That's don't even right. compare to, to uh, New Orleans uh, at I all. Had like, my first, I had my first Sazerac the first night I was there because back then you couldn't get a Sazerac in New York City or anywhere really except New Orleans. And so I'd heard of it and people told me about it. And so I had to order one. And then I just kind of went on a spree and I ordered a Sazerac everywhere I went just to see what they were like. They are different everywhere, but also the same. Yep. Kind of like the brandy old fashioned in Wisconsin. Yeah. They're, they're all the, basically the same, but they're all slightly different. Slightly depending deep. on where you go. Yep. Excellent. Well, that's question one. That's a great okay. story. So see, hey. not so hard. No, not hard at all. <laughs> all right. So, on to question two, drink two, what are we drinking? We're drinking a Negroni. Excellent. The classic cocktail. We keep it pretty classic here in our home. We drink a lot of Manhattans and Martinis and Negronis and things like that. Uh, nothing simpler. It's three ingredient cocktail. Um, and here's a little plug for, I wrote a book called Three Ingredient Cocktails, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, it's got gin using a uh, bee feeder, Excellent. which I like, and sweet vermouth using Martini and Rossi today. All right. And I ran out of uh, Campari because I drink a lot of Negronis. So this, but you can use any red bitter really from Italy. This is from the south of Italy. It's, it's kind of obscure. It's called Caffo, oh. red bitter. And uh, they all taste slightly different from one another, but uh, it's close enough to Campari that it works. Excellent. And then, of course, with an orange twist. Excellent. Cheers, Cheers. my friend. Ah. That's delicious. Excellent. Oh, that's good. That's just a, a really nice. I, I, I love the, the whole, just simple classic cocktails, like just three ingredients. Very yeah. Nice. Perfect. What gin, what gin did you use? Uh, I used, uh, I've been on, uh, it's called Ornabrack Gin. It's an Irish gin. So oh, I don't uh, know that one. Um, and then also there's uh, uh, a Three Floyds out of Indiana that I've been kind of uh, digging yeah. lately. I, I really like their th the Three Floyds gin. It's, it's been, I've heard of that one. I've heard of been, that one. Um, everybody, everybody makes gin now. Everybody makes yeah, gin. Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, it's, it's that spirit that kind of comes in that uh, it, 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 it's easy to, to make and helps your distillery make money before the whiskey's ready. So That's right. That's right. Um, so, all right, question two. You, you've written a book, uh, you know, about many classic cocktails. We even just talked about it, the plug for the, the three drink, uh, uh, three ingredient cocktails. What do you think is gonna be the next modern classic for our cocktails? Oh, that's interesting. Um, this is a subject that I actually think about a lot. Um, uh, and I, I make a sort of a, a hobby of trying to pinpoint which cocktails created during the cocktail renaissance of the last 20 years actually get popular enough to be called a modern classic. Um, and uh, cause there are a lot of classic cocktails, but not so many in the modern age. So which one do you, which one is next? Um, there were quite a few cocktails that became modern classics in the early years, like 2007 through 2010, because there were so many drinks that hadn't been invented yet. And so the bartenders could create simple cocktails that were new and they would catch on. Um, after that, everything got a little bit uh, ornate and uh, complicated. Um, there's one I noticed recently uh, that I believe is now a modern classic. It's not actually a new cocktail. It was invented, I believe, back in 2005 in San Francisco. It's called the Black Manhattan. You ever had a Black Manhattan? I do believe so. 
Yeah, it's got um, Averna in it, which is an Amaro out of Italy. It's just a spin on um, on the Manhattan. And it's it's been around, but then in the last couple of years, suddenly it started appearing everywhere. It was on menus and cocktail books, uh, written about online. And so some of these drinks, it takes a long time for them to become a classic. Some are classics overnight. Um, like, um, say, the Oaka Old Fashioned, which was invented at Death and & Company and is an old fashioned made with mezcal and tequila. That, that was uh, popular right away. Um, but this one took a long time. And um, I actually have a, an app that I created called Modern Classics of the Cocktail Renaissance. And it has about 100 drinks on it. And whenever I think a new drink has reached that level that it's modern classic, I add it to the app. And that's the most recent drink that I added to the app, the Black Man app. Excellent. Is that available for uh, OS and Android? Uh, not Android. It's just on iPhones. Um, okay. I, I did it in collaboration with a guy named Martin Duderoff. He's the IT guy and I'm whatever, the writer. Uh, and uh, it's available on iTunes if people are interested. That's question two. We're flying that's through. Question two. Yeah. All right. Modern classics. Excellent. On to question three. First, what are we drinking? Uh, we are drinking a martini. Excellent. Most famous cocktail in the world. There you go. Um, been drinking a lot of these over the last year. Um, you have it right behind you. Uh, this book came out last year. It's the history of the martini cocktail and with about, how many recipes? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I've gotten to know martinis really well. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a classicist as usual. So I use the classic kind of London dry gins, which I think work best. Again, we're using Beefeater in this. I'm a little mad at Beefeater right now because they recently lowered the ABV on the US version from 47% to 44%. Oh, wow. Yeah, they did that during the pandemic. I don't think they thought anyone would notice. <laughs> um, so that is really a drag. It's still a good gin, but you know, it's better at 47%. And for the vermouth, uh, we got some uh, Dolan dry vermouth. See, that's there, that's what I it. used as well. Um, from Chambray in France. And I did it at three parts gin, one part vermouth. I do orange bitters, which is the historically, the way you made martinis with bitters. The orange bitters and uh, a lemon twist. Olives are fine, but I like a twist. Sometimes I do olives and a twist. That's nice. Um, and that's it. Martini. And it's served in a nice little Nick and Nora glass. There we go. You've got a kind of a coupe. Yep. Yep. Cheers. What gin are you? Are you? What gin are you using there? I went with the three Floyds. The so. three Floyds from Indiana. You said right. Yep. yep. Okay. I, okay. I'm not much of a, a, a gin fella, but uh, it, it, during the pandemic, it, it's been growing on me. So uh, uh, yeah. I, I've just started to explore a little bit of the, the gin myself. So I... The things that go fastest in this house, in this order, gin, <laughs> bourbon, rye, sweet vermouth, dry vermouth, Campari. Those disappear. <laughs> Other things hang around like Spanish moss and you can't get rid of them. There you go. For me, it's all Irish whiskey. So a lot of it. Oh, like nice. That, that Calbagan that you had is a lovely uh, uh, sipper. I use that for my hot toddies a lot. So uh, Irish whiskey makes a good hot toddy. Yeah. And uh, so it, it's just, uh, yeah, one of my the favorites. So yeah, for me, it's, it's Irish and then bourbon. Well, probably rye and then bourbon uh, and then... Uh, just started getting into the gin and, and rum, so. Uh. I, um, we have a little cocktail pod here in Brooklyn and uh, went to a friend's with some stoop drinks. We gather on the stoop, you know, socially distant. I brought some hot toddies and I used Irish whiskey. I used uh, Green Spot. You Very know, nice. But yeah, they, it was delicious. Those yeah. are delicious Green, hot toddies. Yeah. Green Spot is oh, it's, uh, an amazing, uh, that's an amazing uh, sipper right there. That is, it's so good. All right, so question three. Question three. You, I mean, you've traveled everywhere. You, you, you've reviewed places. Do you have an absolute favorite 
establishment. Like when you walk in, you're like, I'm home. Like this is it. Kind of bar. Um, sure. Uh, it's right in this neighborhood. I believe you and I live in the same neighborhood. Yes, in Brooklyn. We do. Um, and so my favorite bar in Brooklyn is the Long Island Bar. Okay. It's over on Atlantic Street near Henry. Have you been? I have not. Oh, you should go once. I mean, they are doing outdoor seating now, but they'll open again. It's just this bar. It used to be a, uh, a diner from the 1930s and the interior is perfectly preserved. And it's just a, a beautiful space. Um, they serve, uh, it's a very limited cocktail menu, but it's like classics and they're all, they're all fantastic. Um, it's owned by a Wisconsinite like us. His name is Toby Cicchini. And so he has the best fried cheese curds in town. Oh, well, I um, think he probably has the only fried cheese curds in town. So. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> and um, every bartender there is, uh, is very skilled. Uh, not in a flashy way, but they're all great cocktail bartenders. So um, that's, that's my place. I actually did, um, I've done two book parties there. I did a book party there for the old fashioned book and a book party there for the martini book. Um, I've just been there on countless occasions. My wife and I go there all the time. Um, so that's here in the city. I mean, in other cities, there are other places. Uh, I'm from Milwaukee and there is a wonderful old cocktail bo bar there called Bryant's Cocktail Lounge. Yep. The oldest cocktail bar in Milwaukee. And that, if you've been there, you know, that's a very special place. And it's, it's gorgeous. Yes. It's, it's wonderful. That's a kind of frozen in time in the 1950s. They've got this great old um, stereo behind the bar, you know, with this kind of warm music that it plays. I forget, I think it's a Macintosh. And they got a fish tank there. The lights are extremely low. So like when you walk in, it takes about two minutes to adjust. You're blind for, <laughs> for a little bit. Um, and it's, and I know the owner, his name is jo John Dye. He's a really nice guy from Montana. And, um, it's, it's just a lovely, lovely place. I miss that place. I miss that place. I haven't been to Wisconsin all year and I usually go to Bryant's at least twice a year. There are Wisconsin bars here in New York. There are, yes. And, uh, and we can make our own brandy old fashions. Th there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so on to question four. What are we question drinking? Question four. What are we drinking? What are we drinking? We're drinking, we're staying classic. Moving on to the nightcap, we're having an old fashioned. Excellent. I actually have mine with an old fashioned spoon in it, which is how they used to serve it back in the 19th century. Very you, nice. You used it to like stir up the sugar at the bottom. And when it was done, you would scoop up the sugar and eat it. <laughs> These were very common, not anymore. Um, I actually collaborated uh, with a company named Cocktail Kingdom. They make bar equipment and barware. Um, because I noticed, uh, I, I wrote, uh, again, I'm showing another book. I wrote this book, The Old Fashioned, back in 2014. And I noticed that most of the old fashioned glasses that were out there, they're really double old fashioned glasses. They're quite big. But back in the day, like when the old fashioned was invented in uh, like the 1880s, 1890s, when it first started becoming popular, the glasses were rather small. They would hold their uh, three ounces, four ounces tops, and they had like a big heavy bottom like this. Um, and there were really no single old fashioned glasses on the market. And so I asked um, Cocktail Kingdom if they would want to make one and collaborate with it. And so they did. And uh, so it, here it, uh, it says old fashioned in the front of the glass. I Very nice. Wait a minute. Yeah, you can sort of see it. And if you buy, you buy it and it comes in a kit with a little muddler, you know, so you can muddle the sugar at the bottom because that's how it was done and a spoon. So it's, it's nice. Um, anyway, so I, uh, I drink a lot of these obviously. Um, and what did I make it with today? Uh, oh, I, well, I didn't bring the bottle out, but it's Michter's, uh, Michter's rye. Very nice. Uh, I like Michter's a lot. I like everything they do. Um, they're, they're in Kentucky, obviously. The Michter's name is an old name. It's actually a, a Maryland um, whiskey name. Here, my wife is just handing me a bottle. All right. Thanks, Mary Kate. You're welcome. Okay, there it is. There we go, Michter's. Um, and 
but but they uh, they they bought the rights to the name, which is a Maryland name, and they took it to Kentucky and started making whiskey there for a while, like ten years. They didn't make their own whiskey because, as you know, it takes a long time to make whiskey. Um, they they sourced whiskey from other distilleries and bottled it under their name, and then they started producing their own whiskey, but with very little change. There was a consistency in flavor profile, and um, unlike many distilleries uh, out in Kentucky. Uh, which are pretty static, you know, they stay the same. You know, wild turkey always tastes like wild turkey and Jim Beam always tastes like Jim Beam. But mixtures just kept getting better. The whiskey just kept tasting better and better. I mean, they were getting better at what they did. Um, so it's uh, it's easily one of my uh, top five bourbons and ryes um, out of Kentucky. This is rye. An old fashioned can be made with bourbon or rye. Um, some people think rye is more classical. Um, Bourbon is more popular, but um, either way. And so it's just uh, sugar, muddled sugar cube, bitters, Angostura bitters, whiskey, ice, orange twist, done. Excellent. Cheers. Well, cheers. I, I made you listen to a lot of stuff before you got to drink. Sorry about no, that. No worries. <laughs> I, it, and again, you, you kind of are uh, jumping into a little bit of my question, but Again, going back that, you know, we're both from Wisconsin, which is kind of the the home to the Supper Club Old Fashioned and yes. all the great variants. <laughs> mm -hmm. For you, what makes the best Old Fashioned, I guess? I mean, I know you covered it in the book a little bit, but like, just what, what, what like, if you could sit down and have like, what, what to you is the perfect Old Fashioned? Well, uh, first it has to do with context. I mean, as you said, we're both from Wisconsin. So when I make old fashions at home or I have them here in New York or most places I have them like this, it's a whiskey old fashioned and it's made relatively simple and none of the muddled fruit at the muddled cherry and orange at the bottom. But if I'm in Wisconsin, it doesn't make any sense to order it that way in Wisconsin. You drink as the locals do and that's a brandy old fashioned made with domestic brandy and the muddled fruit and like a little Sprite on top and all that ridiculousness. So, um, but let's just say I drink a lot more of these than the brandy old fashions. Okay. Um, what makes a good one? Well, I think it has to be good whiskey. It doesn't have to be like top shelf. You don't need to use like a hundred dollar bottle in, a, in an old fashioned. You can make an old fashioned with just a, a decent rye or bourbon. Um, I think it's all about balance, like many cocktails. Uh, you want just the amount of, uh, right amount of sugar. You don't want it too sweet, but you don't want it too strong. You want the right amount of bitters. You also want that uh, a little bit dilution, you know, so when you put the ice and you stir it and because it, it shouldn't be just a glass of whiskey. There's got to be some water in there. It's got to yeah. soften the edges. Uh, I, I like one big cube. Uh, when there's a lot of little cubes in there, I don't like it. It, it doesn't look good and also it dilutes really quickly and you end up with this kind of watery drink, which isn't very satisfying. Agreed. Um, when you have your first sip of an old fashioned, there should be a bite to it. It's because you really taste that whiskey because it's, it's a whiskey drink. It's a whiskey cocktail. But then as you go on, it gets softer and more mellow. And you just, and so you can linger over it. You know, a good old fashioned, you can spend like 15 minutes, 20 minutes drinking. Excellent. And then uh, are you a simple syrup guy or are you sugar cube muddled? Uh, and then I go also back and forth. I go back and forth. I, I love I love the ritual of the sugar cube, muddling the sugar cube at the bottom of the glass. And that's how they originally did it. They didn't do simple syrup back in the day when it was invented. But I do understand in bars that is not practical. Simple syrup is a lot quicker. Also, most customers don't want that gritty sugar at the bottom of the glass. They don't like that. They, they think that's a sign that the drink has been made poorly as opposed to historically. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a, I can see uh, both sides. I'm a fan of both. And then uh, I, I noticed you, you do have an orange peel, but how do you feel? Like, again, we don't like model cherries, but uh, do you have a cherry in your... Uh, Old fashioned, or are you? Um, only, the... only when I'm in Wisconsin or an old bar where they do the muddled uh, fruit, then I just don't get in the way, and I do that. 
Uh, sometimes if I don't have an orange on hand, I'll do a lemon twist. And sometimes I'll do both, lemon and orange, which is called rabbit ears. Um, but uh, if it's like this, no, I, I don't do a cherry. Okay. And then uh, how do you feel about uh, people adding other things into it uh, of adjusting the classic recipe of, of that old fashioned? Of oh, that's like fine. That. There, there's a long tradition of messing around with the old fashioned. That's the reason why it has the name the old fashioned. The full name is Old Fashioned Whiskey Cocktail. It used to just be the Whiskey Cocktail, but bartenders started adding this and dashes of that until customers said, no, I want an Old Fashioned Whiskey Cocktail, not a newfangled one. So it's an Old Fashioned. And that continues to this day. The Old Fashioned is not just a drink, but it's a template. Yep. People use this, this recipe to create all kinds of drinks. So if you want to make it with maple syrup instead of simple syrup, simple syrup, that's fine. If you want to use... I don't know, um, like uh, chocolate bitters instead of Angostura bitters, or, or if you even want to use an entirely different spirit, you know, make a Scotch old fashioned, an Irish whiskey old fashioned, a Geneva old fashioned, you know, it's all good. I, I, I agree with you I, on all, all accounts. I do, I do like a little cherry in mine. I have a, oh, yep, there we go. Uh, yeah, okay. everyone, yeah. Got you, you, you've, got, um, you've got some history to stand on there. That works, yeah. Uh, uh, the one of the, so the place is called Mother's Ruin, and uh, there's a oh, bartender yeah. there uh, named Aaron Ruth. And Aaron, in my opinion, makes the best old fashioned in the world. And uh, the reason why is because no matter what, her old fashions all taste the same. So like you're gonna like her muscle memory is down tack to making a a proper old fashioned. So it could be the first one or the fifth one, and they all taste wonderful so uh yeah i believe that because at, at mother's ruin they free pour everything they yes free, pour, free pour or die is there uh, yeah so they have to be good bartenders if they're going to get it the same every time yep and so yeah uh so in my opinion mother's aaron ruth from mothers has the best uh uh old-fashioned in, in well, the world so i'll have to check her out when uh I don't know if Mother's Ruin is open, but if they are, I'll, I'll go I'll go check her out. Excellent. So, on to our fifth and final question, drink of the night. What are we drinking? All right, this is the last drink. So, we've made a progression on this. We started out with a highball. Then we went to an aperitif drink, like the Negroni. Then you get a martini, which is like a drink you would have in the middle of the meal. Old-fashioned after the meal. And now it's time for dessert. So, we are having a Brandy Alexander. Excellent. Um, I don't know if you can see, but there's some like grated nutmeg there on top. Ooh, very nice. And uh, we are using Cognac uh, Chateau de Poissons. Very nice. That's what I happened to pick up and what I happened to have on hand. And for the creme de cacao, um, this is the best in my opinion, a Tempest Fugit, it's out of California, that make a really good artisanal creme de cacao because a lot of the other ones you find on the market are really overly sweet and syrupy. And then of course, cream. Um, and then some nutmeg dusted on top. Uh, cheers. Cheers. Um, I, I think the Brandy Alexander is a great drink. I think it's kind of undersung, um, uh, kind of neglected. A lot of those drinks like the Grasshopper and the Brandy Alexander are not popular anymore. Uh, people don't drink them the way they used to. But um, if it's made in a, a very well balanced way, that's not too syrupy, and it actually has a very potent uh, spirit in it, like a good brandy, um, it's a good drink. I, I like to order them sometimes in bars because cocktail bartenders do not get orders for Brandy Alexanders very often. So if you order a Brandy Alexander or a Grasshopper or something like that, you keep them on your their toes. Yeah, they you know. And they go, oh, wow, I haven't made that in a while. As like, I think I've got, okay, I'm going to have to think about this a second. And whenever you make the bartender think for a second, you're going to get a good drink because, you know, they're not doing it by rote. They actually think, okay, what makes a good Brandy Alexander? Okay, let's do this. So... Anyway, it's delicious, yeah. right? Yeah, it's so good. Um, there's a there's the ice cream bar in Milwaukee. Um, at random. At random, yes. Yeah. If you order a brand Alexander in uh, Wisconsin, chances are you will get the ice cream version of that. Yes. So instead of cream, 
they just mix up the brandy and creme de cacao with ice cream in a blender and pour it in like a big soda fountain kind of glass. Yep. And it's delicious. It's delicious. It is. It, yeah. It, it, that, that's I'm not going to do that here. <laughs> <laughs> that's too much. Yeah, no, it's but, also like 2,000 calories. So yeah. uh, forget it. <laughs> it puts you in a diabetic shock right off the bat. That's oh. right. You just uh, order it for two with two spoons. Yep, there you go. You get it at the soda fountain. I, I loved At Random. At Random, it, that was also another one of those places where you walked in and it, it took you about two hours for your eyes to adjust because you, you go in and it was always so dark and they had the, yeah. the, everything was neon and it was just, it was amazing. Yeah, that was that was a damn good bar. Love that bar. Yeah, they're... Yeah. Um, I heard that they're doing outdoor seating and they've bought some of those like plastic igloos. Oh, okay. Have you seen these things? So like if you're a party of four, you could just go inside. It's no problem. You order your drinks, you're warm, you're protected. I wish, I, it sounds like a lot of fun. I wish I could be there. Excellent. Yeah, same. I, yeah. Uh, but hopefully soon. All right, right. So on to our fifth and final question of the night. Not even midnight yet. So we, we flew oh, through no, everything. We uh, we have our Whiskey Wednesday coin. You can flip it, you can spin it, you can do whatever you want, but the coin will tell us the, the answer, and that way no one gets in trouble. And it, it's so all do we, the quest, on... do we know the question before I flip it, or not? Uh, yeah, I, I, will, I will read you the question, and then you can go ahead and flip it. Okay. Uh, all right, so we know that the pen is mightier than the sword, but is the pen mightier than a Manhattan? Hold on. <laughs> it uh, it says fuck no. Fuck no. So we get more <laughs> truths from the pen than we do from drinking a Manhattan. So, well. Uh, uh, wait a minute. So the pen. So that means the Manhattan's stronger than the pen. Is that okay, right? All right. Yes. Yes. So, which so I yes. probably agree with. It's pretty damn strong. <laughs> we get more truths from the Manhattan than we do from the pen. Right. Perfect. I would be okay with either answer on that question. There, you know, I would agree. It, again, it, it, it's just a, a nice way to just exit out. So it's always yeah. something fun. And then the coin, keep it in your uh, breast pocket. So one, it will protect bullets because uh, it's nice and heavy and thick. And then two, if you ever just need a, an important life decision, you can just pull out the coin and flip it. and. Yeah, I'll bring it to bars, you know, when I'm trying deciding whether I should have one more drink. That, that's know. actually that's actually where it started from. So it it was uh that's how that's how we did it. Uh, again, starting with like Whiskey Wednesday, uh, we're we're going on our our 15th year of Whiskey Wednesday, and it, you know, start with pregame. Usually we start at Mother's, and then we end up at the Spaniard, and then we go to Little Branch, which is where Whiskey Wednesday was founded. Oh, really? Okay, great. And then add a boy, and then usually from add a boy, we flip the coin to see if we're going to one more place or not, and that usually ends up to be Dutch kills, and that's always a long hike. Um, and then, and then if you keep spinning, you know it's it's going to be a terrible Thursday. So it's it's. Uh, it, <laughs> Those are all good bars. Uh, uh, Little Branches is my favorite place on earth. So like, really, uh, that is. Uh, that that's where whiskey wednesday was started uh my my photo is hung behind table one uh so uh, i i i've been there going there for 14 years they, they they've been uh around for 15. we we celebrate our birthdays or anniversaries a week apart uh i think sasha was a genius and uh just a really great guy uh richie Bacato, uh for, again was the door guy at little and he he went to go open up dutch kills uh and R richie I, I consider a great mentor because he's he's taught me how to carve ice spheres and everything so like my ice game is because of richie oh. uh and uh, like and sammy and mickey from attaboy you can't go wrong with so uh, that's right that's I right they're two great lads that just want to have a good time so uh, <laughs> yeah i thought they are yeah <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Robert, I want to say thank you again for your time. It was a really great pleasure talking to you. Yeah. I really enjoy your books. And I hope that after maybe all this is over, we can share a drink together since we live like literally like three blocks apart. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I want. I want to. I want to go on that bar crawl you mentioned. I, that 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 sounds like a good time. Uh, you're welcome anytime. I, I would love to take you out. So like. Yeah. Please, like, it, let me know. Uh, it'd be really great to. to yeah. Uh, when we get to the other side. Yeah. We will do that. So uh, one more. One more. Cheers to you. Cheers. Thank cheers. you again. We made it. Five questions, five questions. Here we go. Done. Not even close to midnight. <laughs>